I just wanted to introduce myself briefly. I joined the Mahogany Board in March this year, and I'm a writer and historian. And I first encountered Mahogany via a performance of Snappies that included Erilyn Warland's The Night House Wave of 2017. So this is a quite special occasion for me to actually meet Erilyn. And I hope that some of Mahogany's key values and distinctive approach, which is precisely what has attracted me to it, will be woven into our discussions in the course of the evening. I mean, just to give you a sense of what's specially important to me, a kind of openness, a commitment to collaboration, what I like to think of as research and development, a very strong commitment to process and working together. And also a quest to find the meanings of potential, uh, meanings and potential of opera for the 21st century. We see this, as Penny said, as a pilot, and we would really love your feedback as well as your active participation. I'm going to introduce you to our three speakers, and I'm going to ask them to just get things launched to give us a brief reply to the question, what does this project mean to you? And then Freddie will say a bit more about Dido's ghosts, and then we will probe the collaboration between Erilyn and Wes a bit more. And we very much hope to be able to start, perhaps just to touch on, the discussion about the future of opera. And in my notes, I want to stress that that's in heavy inverted commas for reasons that I hope will emerge over the course of this conversation and perhaps over many conversations in the future. So let me start with Erilyn. So Erilyn is a singer-songwriter. She's a composer of contemporary classical music. She does multimedia work, but I think it's best to simply say that she is a musician with a formidable um, catalogue of, of compositions behind her who is dedicated to not seeing barriers. And I really love the way she expresses this. Many of you will know her from the really magnificent Jerusalem arrangement that she did for the last night of the proms, which was dedicated to the Windrush generation. And we're absolutely thrilled that Golda Schultz, who sang so magnificently on that occasion, is also joining us for this discussion this evening. Now, it's interesting to me that Wes is also a singer-songwriter. He's a writer of fiction. And if you haven't read anything by him, can I warmly recommend his short story on his website, which is called A Ma Man With No Shadow. Now, I read this the other day with great interest and I thought, wow, what a wonderful opera this would make. And then I discovered that he's already written a whole album of songs. So maybe indeed, Wes is already a writer of opera, even before Dido's Ghosts. The final member of our panel is Freddie Wake Walker, who will be known to many of you. And of course, it's hard to sum Freddie up in a few words. It's hard to sum all of our panel up in a few words. He's an opera director with interdisciplinary interests that are both broad and deep. He's a driving force at Mahogany. But I'd also like to draw your attention um, to Freddie as an innovative thinker, a thinker about what it means to make the kinds of music we're calling opera in inverted commas, as well as highly original in the kinds of ways that he actually puts opera on. And I think it's this deep reflection, which is one of the most valuable characteristics of, of Mahogany. So let's turn now to my question. What does this project mean to you? And I'd like to ask Erilyn if she'd be willing to start, please. Well, I'm not very good with spoken words. Um, I, I do really think in music, but this is a project that I've wanted to do for years and years and years. And ever since, you know, I studied uh, Greek mythology as a kid at school, I was really obsessed with this story. Uh, I was obsessed with the Aeneid, in fact. And the character of Dido um, has absorbed a lot of my thinking for many years. And Purcell's up for a towering achievement as it is. I've often wondered, 
more, I've often thought about Aeneas and the role of Aeneas. He doesn't have so much to say in a personal, and this chance, Dido's goes to bring these two, you know, epic characters uh, to confront each other is just very exciting. And the, I have to say, every opera is a, such a collaborative experience. And this truly does feel like a dream team. I mean, John Buck can't be with us tonight, but when we did our workshops just a couple of weeks ago, just the first sort of sightings of the music, uh, Freddie was there, John was there, Wes was on the phone, and then there was me. It felt as if it was a room full of um, fantastic experts, not, but not just dry academics. We, to take on a project like this, I feel we have to really delve quite deeply into emotional terrain. This, after all, is, a, is one of the most tragic love stories. Thank you. That's a, a wonderful way to begin. Wes, would you like to follow on? Well, I mean, I, it's very similar to what Erilyn said, in fact, but part of the reason what it means to me is the chance to firstly to collaborate with Erilyn, whose work I love and whom I personally adore. Uh, we met through a very, very close mutual friend in New York, and this opera collaboration comes very, very naturally out of chatting. Um, also, I too am obsessed uh, with the Purcell's Died in Aeneas, in that I think it's about the most, you know, perfect hour you could have. And when um, I thought about it a lot over the years, and when, when we talk later about how we came to start thinking about it, part of it was that I was involved writing a novel about the idea was, let's look at the Dido myth and then watch it kind of become tawdry through history. So that in the first case, in, in the Aeneid, it's a man leaving his lover to found a kingdom on a divine mission. And in the last version of the story, it was going to be a bloke leaving his lover to go back to his wife. You know, and it was going to be, and, and I never wrote that book um, because I started writing something else. And this is the result of that is I researched this opera because Erilyn and I came up with the idea 10 years ago. I researched it for 10 years and wrote it in three weeks. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Thank you. Can I say, I think one theme that's beginning to emerge is about the role of trust in collaboration, because I understand both of you to have placed considerable weight on this. Freddie, what does this project mean to you? Well, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but yeah, I was also going to say, um, you know, the chance to work with Erilyn again and the chance to work with Wes um, is such a privilege and I'm enjoying it so hugely. Um, we also have the most incredible cast of which Golda is leading the, the cast as um, playing the role of Dido's ghost. Um, and so that's all incredibly exciting. I think one thing about the piece in particular is that it combines these two worlds, these, the, the old world and the new world. And when I'm working with Mahogany, I'm working with living composers most of the time. Um, and when I'm working outside Mahogany, I'm working with dead composers most of the time. Um, and this project brings all of that together in a very mutual and, and wonderful way. The other thing actually to say, just within the context of now and the chaos and uncertainty that we're all experiencing, that actually this piece for me is a, a lifeline to music and creativity. Um, and you know, the chance to be in that rehearsal room workshopping this um, a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was, um, was more than special. It was, it sort of felt necessary really for my well-being, if I'm totally honest. <laughs> Freddie, thank you. I think it'd be very helpful if you could take us through, Freddie, the structure of the piece and, and, and how you see it. Yeah, so, um, so Dido's Ghost is essentially a sequel to Dido and Aeneas. So Aeneas has left Carthage and gone to Italy um, in order to ultimately found Rome. And he marries Lavinia, who's the daughter of the king of the Latins. Um, but then, washed up on the shores, um, a few years later, he finds a woman who looks remarkably like Dido. Um, but it's not Dido, it's Anna, Dido's sister. But of course, this brings back lots of memories and feelings of nostalgia and remorse. 
um, and he takes her in and takes her back to the palace. And at the, the welcome banquet uh, for Anna, they put on a mask. Um, and I'm sure you can all guess what the opera is that they perform at the banquet. So then we, we have a performance of Dido and Aeneas happening at this banquet. And it gets more intertwined and complicated in a beautiful way because Anna is then asked to step up onto the stage and play the role of Dido. And Aeneas is asked to step up onto the stage and play the role of Aeneas. And then it develops further and other characters also take on characters in the opera and towards the end, the opera and the opera um, starts to, to blend. And um, I'm not sure if I'm gonna tell you anything more about the very end, but <laughs> um, that's basically the, that basically the idea. Is that fair, Wes, have I, have I got it? Because yeah, it's, it's a terrific relief to have somebody else explain it for once. <laughs> I can tell you, it's the first time I've ever heard anybody else do it. Um, that was exciting. Yeah, I mean, the idea, well, perhaps, perhaps I'll wait for Lumila's next question and that will lead us to the next thing. But it seems to me we've got two threads going here now. One is about the fact that Erolyn and Wes both have a very powerful affinity for the ancient stories. And I do think that's a conversation that is never finished about what it is about these mythic stories that touch us so deeply. And I think it can't ever be finished because the answers change as we and our circumstances change. But the other uh, theme that I think we're beginning to touch on is how you effect a kind of blending between the contemporary and what I'm going to call the mythic. And I wonder if Erolyn and Wes could reflect on that a bit. Erolyn, would you like to start? I see this as, in musical terms, as a, as a very deep conversation with, um, you know, the early Baroque and Purcell. And the more I think of it that way, the easier it's going to be but definitely I have to um, um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, trying to imagine in Purcell's time how they, they in turn viewed this myth. And it, it, their story here was told in a very different way. I think uh, Wes and I are trying to get close to the really, um, the primal feelings which are slightly intentionally are not there in the Purcell. And you know, I. I was thinking, I have at my disposal chromaticism, I have percussion instruments, I have um, different ways of working with rhythms that Purcell didn't have at his disposal. So I'm trying to understand Purcell from his viewpoint, but then bring, you know, Ellen and Wallen into the mix too, in, uh, with nothing but love and respect, but uh, sometimes there's some, there'll be some subversion there. So it's just trying, and always for me, why I'm a, uh, why I love writing up is always trying to get close to these characters as close as I can through intervals, harmony, rhythm. And and the Purcell is, in its sense, a very funny version of Di. It's a very odd version to have gone through the ages of Dido and Aeneas because there aren't any gods in Purcell. There's no Juno. There's no Mercury. There's no you know, Jove, there is some witches and a sprite pretending to be a messenger. And ultimately the point of the Purcell seems to be, if it was indeed performed in a girls' school, seems to be, girls, watch out for boys passing through, they can't be trusted. That's about the deep mythical level of the Purcell. So when you or Freddie said so um, accurately that it's a dialogue between old and new, not only, because of the uh, Purcell in there, is it a dialogue between old music and Erilyn Wallen's music, but also the very crux of the whole uh, uh, story that we're telling is that Aeneas comes from a world where he was and was affected by the gods, Juno, Venus his mother, four 
Rome for his divine mission, Juno against it because Venus got the apple ages ago, not her. She's still against Troy. She's still against Aeneas founding. She's against Rome. So he came from that. But where we find him in the opera is at the end of his life, after he's done everything he really has to do. And he is in a sense, awaiting the return of the gods to speak to him. And without giving too much away, Dido's ghost returns to him and gives him one last mission in order to um, break the curse she's made on the Trojan race as she died. So, yes, the, it, you know, because the key thing here is that my original conception of it was simply that because, you know, Dido and Aeneas is so great, but it's so short and people, I, I believe, I'm, you know, have tried to make it a longer night's entertainment in the history of opera many times since its return to the repertoire. And my idea was simply to have it as, as, as a mask in the middle of this other story that I'd found in Ovid's Fasti, which Freddie has just explained. And, that, and I must say the story I'm telling and Erilyn is telling with music is just a sequel that I found in Fast Die by Ovid. I didn't know it existed until I was doing my own research into the Dido. And so my, the idea there was to have, I've slightly lost the thread I was going, what I was going to say, and it was going so well then, but, but that uh, when, he, that my idea was simply to have it as a mask in the middle, a self-contained thing, but it was other people, including Erilyn and Freddie, most helpfully, who said, you know, it shouldn't just be in the middle, it should, they should go into each other. They should, I'd already, I, it, it was obvious that Dido would be Anna and Aeneas would be Aeneas in the opera, within the opera. But then when we started to play around with some shifting identities and seeing how that, then it, then it became deep and really exciting. And of course, then that is where the dialogue between old and new is played out in Erilyn and Purcell's music. What a thing to think about that is. So I'd like to us to focus a little bit more on that. So I think we've agreed that these mythic stories are inexhaustible and that they are extraordinarily emotionally potent. But the project that the three of you are engaged in involves some actually quite practical melding between old and new. And it seems to me that that's one of the things that must be at the heart of Erilyn and Wes's collaboration, and then at the heart of what Freddie's going to do in interpreting that. And I wonder if one way of thinking about that is, is about how we blend languages that occur at different, occur, you know, arose in different periods, whether they're verbal languages or musical languages. Erilyn, would you like to? Well, I would, I would like to say that in Wes's, uh, in Wes's um, libretto, he's found a, a way of writing and la language that is absolutely perfect. I think this would be a really difficult task for, for most writers to achieve, but maybe it's because um, Wes has written so many, the first novel I read of Wes was a, was a book fantastic novel called Misfortune. Um, Wes has this real love of language but across centuries and he somehow has found a, a language that is both modern and has a mythic element to it which I think is so superb. So I, I, I would say that would have to be the starting point just before yeah. you can even get on to the music. And also you know... Have some uh, examples please. Well, Erilyn and I have collaborated on one thing before that's gotten slightly forgotten even by me. Yeah, the I forgot, I forgot that, Wesley. But we wrote, uh, she wanted, uh, I gave her, a. Um, there's a famous folk song called Famous Flower of the Serving Men. And I wrote a kind of more slightly, only slightly more modern version of it called From Eleanor to Sweet William, because it's about one of those dressing, cutting your hair and dressing up as a boy to get revenge stories. And, um, and that's where it that's where that language Erilyn's talking about comes from. It's from wanting to sing folk songs, but not wanting to necessarily have thee and thou in it. So what you have to do is 
avoid all modern idiom that can't be, you know, obviously you can't say let's put on the record player, but also, um, you know, you, you can't have a, a modern, you know, cliche of any kind. So, so the words themselves have to be perfectly timeless. Everything has to be perfectly timeless. And the natural world is very timeless. People have always talked about the sea and rivers and mountains. And, and so, you know, if you situate it nicely, it can do, but also it came down very much to a sense of rhyming. And as a lyricist, I'm very keen on the rhymes, but with this piece I wrote, with this, when I was writing it for Erilyn, it's, it's hard to explain, but the rhymes are very present, but very not at the end of the lines. They're, they give it a very, I think, uh, uh, oh, I don't know what to say. A bounce, a bounce yes. A bounce. Yes. They, they give it a bounce. I mean, I don't have the libretto in front of me, but I could read you any four lines and you'd know exactly what I mean. The, the, there's a lot of assonance in it. Can I just interject, because Golda, I saw you put a comment up, but because I was just talking then, I couldn't concentrate on your comment. Did you want to come in on that? No, it was really a question that I had, because um, Wes had made a state, you guys had been talking about this notion of um, old and new commentary and how the way you're writing your music is kind of a dialogue and a commentary on what Purcell himself wrote and then Wes spoke about the old moral of the Purcell work you know girls beware of young men coming calling so my question was is this, the way that you're right that the way I'm understanding Dido's ghost it's more are, we, are you talking in it in terms of a feminist aspect where it's like gentlemen beware the beware the wreckage you leave behind <laughs> or or is that a secondary comment to what's going on in the story Answer was. <laughs> oh, that's a very interesting question. What? How, how can I? How can I best put it without kind of being on the nose too much? I think that Dido is one of, you know, it's considered one of the great. It's a story that's been done great disservice over the years in many ways. Dido has been vilified, and and of course, there's none of that. Um, but. We are trying to look at the role of what who a particularly important character here is Lavinia, the wife that Aeneas takes as you know to take over the Latin race. He marries the king's daughter, and it is their line. Uh, well, it isn't actually, but yeah, you know, that, that is who's going to take over and make Rome. That is the history of the world that's going to happen. That is why Virgil wrote the Aeneid. Sure, the myth was floating around, but he wrote it, the Aeneid, for one reason, to glorify and to give an origin story for the glory of Rome. And in Lavinia, we find somebody who is very, uh, you know nothing about her in the Aeneid, at all. She, nothing, she has not one single line. All that's known about her is her hair catches fire, which is an omen of war, and, you know, she marries Aeneas. Well, um, Ursula Le Guin wrote a sensational novel called Lavinia, which takes the little we know about her um, and, and makes it into a novel. Not, it, she goes in a direction that we don't want to go in, but that is a fully fully feminist rereading the, the novel Lavinia, which you will love, Golda, by the way, I heartily recommend it to you. Um, and it's a fully feminist rereading of Lavinia and that whole last six, it's the second half of the Aeneid, the less read part, the last six books of it. Um, what we have done particularly, it's easier to talk about it with reference to Lavinia than with Dida because we have also made her a whole person because it is her murderous, intent towards Anna, who is a frightening character to her because she comes from the mythical past. She stirs feelings in Aeneas that the Dido and Aeneas playing in front of them makes even more disquieting for her. And until she finds herself hopelessly drawn into the opera by the witches themselves, inviting her to take the stage. So um, and I don't want to give more of the plot away than that, but she is, so I would call this a, I would say, yes, there is strong feminist commentary, and it was stuff that Erilyn and I talked about 
endlessly as we were be because there's no point making Dido and Anahol characters and demonizing Lavinia. We wanted everybody to have their own fully rounded humanity. And of course, that is the problem. That is the crux of the God stuff. Do people have free will? Did they have free will? Of course they did, but only up to a certain extent because the gods were in control of everything. So it's this push and pull. And I, another poem that I was very keen on considering was Tennyson's poem, Ulysses, one of my favorite poems. And I subsumed the Ulysses character into Aeneas as well, where he's a man at the, more or less at the end of his life, looking back for one more moment of glory, one more thing to do, because he doesn't want to sit around at home in peacetime, thinking about how great things are and how he's achieved everything. He wants more. And so at this moment of the opera, and the opera only goes from the morning walk at the seaside to the nighttime, what happens at the end by the river where Anna runs away towards, and that's all I'm saying. And it only it happens in one day. It's, it's, a, it's a very compact piece of work, but because of the Purcell in the middle, it seems to span generations almost. Wes, thank you. I'm glad you're going to bring Freddie in here because I think Golda's question raises some very interesting issues about your interpretation and how you're going to handle what are now being talked of as feminist issues. And I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, the two, the two aspects that I think of with regard to feminism is, I think there's a very interesting question around the relationship between Anna and Dido's ghost. Um, and the way that they come together at the end and the way that they treat each other and, um, and what have you, in contrast to the way that Aeneas has treated Dido um, in, in Dido and Aeneas. Um, and the wonderful challenge from a staging point of view is that we've got Golda playing Anna and Dido's ghost. So how to how to, um, with one person to create these two characters uh, is going to be very exciting. And I think the other thing is, as you kind of said it, Golda, in terms of, I think what this piece does is that it, it really opens up Aeneas, it holds him to account, which the person doesn't do. And I think this, this will, um, yeah, this, this will hold him to account for his actions and and, and, and he will realize, you know, he, he, he will experience true remorse and regret. Uh, and, and, and we will all experience the process that he goes through in terms of coming to terms with what he actually did and how he behaved towards Dido. And in case anybody is muddled, might I say that in Dido and Aeneas, Anna is fully there throughout. But for some reason, and nobody knows why, Nahum Tate, the librettist, changed her name to Belinda. So Anna is, in fact, the Belinda character in the original Dido and Aeneas, although she's known as Anna everywhere in every piece of literature and myth, except in the Purcell opera. Thank you. Um, Wes and Erolyn, I wonder if there's anything more to say about the nature of your collaboration because I think people who aren't creative artists are often very curious about how exactly it works. Do you have Zoom calls? Do you send each other things by email? How does the collaboration unfold? Because I think really understanding collaboration is actually one of the most important tasks we have before us as a society now. So I think if we in Mahogany can make some little tiny contribution to making sure that there are proper conversations about the nature of collaboration, we will be awfully pleased. Oh, I, don't um, uh, I don't usually work with friends, old friends, and it's, it's just by chance I met Wes. I have a friend in New York, who, and it turns out that um, it, it turned out that Wesley's uh, mother was was friendly with my piano teacher, who's the most major influence on my life uh, when I was about 13. So that was the first discovery. Mm -hmm. And the more I have got to know Wes, I just am in awe of his scope of thinking. And so 
I sort of dipped a little bit into his research, but I felt it was so important for me. I, I feel this, that, that when you work with a writer, the, the, the libretto should really have full freedom. And then every so often, often we talk about things. We, as I said before, we talk about the tone of the work, but it, I trusted was 100% to, to come up with something absolutely exciting. And then once those first drafts came in, it's, it's then, for me to think about how to inhabit that world with music and with, with the libretto, that's the beginning. And once music enters, enters, you know, the sound of words sometimes need to change a little bit. And that workshop opened the fact, certain dramaturgical things. So, so I would say that Wesley and I worked together very closely. And then before we had our first workshops, um, it was important that Freddie would come in and just just encourage us to think of the stage in ways that you know neither Wes or I can completely. Yeah. Um, so that, that's what I would say. That's Chris, how do you want to come in on this? Yeah, Freddie. Freddie's late arrival to us it was a late arrival, if you know what I mean, was incredibly vital to pulling. Um, you know, I was really looking forward to a collaborative aspect on this. Uh, he keeps politely po apologizing in emails for, for, you know, making this, but you know, to me, that's all good. Collaboration, what you need, what Erilyn and I do is we get on the phone often meaning to chat about the opera, but in fact, chat about other things for about 45 minutes and then kind of, you know, mention it a little. Because what was really important for me, after we decided what it was going to be, what the, I remember we first started working on this 10 years ago. My first synopsis of Dido's Ghost, whatever it was called back then, was 10 years ago when we were first talking to Dunedin and Mike Hodges and that it had a kind of a previous existence and then it was last October that she texted me and said oh my goodness I you know I think someone's interested in Dido's Ghost and to me my heart leapt because the key thing about collaboration and I mean I don't mean it sound bland is trust I want to know that she that I'm safe in her hands I don't want my I don't want to lock horns with my friend. I want to know that there's love in the room when I make a suggestion and that, that, that she, her suggestions to me, well, she knows she's safe to fully make a criticism. You know what I mean? And so it becomes, in that sense, it becomes, I know from writing songs with people, and which I rarely do, by the way, that that is not always the case and you end up feeling rather alienated and why are we judging each other? This is unpleasant. I'd rather do this on my own what you're bringing to this isn't enough for the agony this is causing me but with Erilyn I think it's just a very warm environment to it and of course that comes out of that but the big leap for me was getting the tone right so I very much had to send her little bits at the beginning very little bits where I just say okay well here's this song for here what do you think of this language it's not exactly what it's saying but what do you think of this tone of language and this bounce and this scansion I've got here? And after I'd done two or three of those and each one she said, I love it, it's great, this is great. And then I, I really wrote it quite quickly and, and it was one of the more exciting, uh, cru you, know, the cr you know, people mythically talk about the crucible of artistic creation, but this was like that for me. It was a great, it was a great, I worked very hard and nobody was, you know, able to get through to me. For Thank you. Um, I think we should move on in a second to the whole question of workshops, because that's something that's very characteristic of the way Freddie works. But I'd like to stay with uh, Wes and Erilyn just for a little moment. So I think Erilyn is well known as someone whom singers love to sing her work. And the performers and audiences are a very important part of this conversation. So I wonder if both of you could say a little bit about how you're thinking about performers and audiences as you're working, or is this so deep in you that you don't need to bring it up to, to full consciousness? Audiences are very, yes, audience is important to me. And the other things when you're writing an opera, I really need to know who I'm composing for so that that character and then the singers there. So, oh my goodness, by twists and turns, we found Gold, or actually 
Freddie found Golda. Um, and that was the day that liftoff happened. And then, so then the chance to work with Golda for the last night of the proms, um, it, it was wonderful to be one last of the proms, but for me, it was a chance to really prepare for Dido. And now I feel I absolutely know Golda's voice. To me, Golda and Dido are one and the same, and Anna, that, that's, and so I'm thinking in sound, you know, that, um, the, my music isn't anywhere near finished, but I can tell you, this is the world I'm swimming and um, dream. I go to bed at night, I'm thinking about Golda's voice. I'm, I'm in this sort of half dream world all the time, which is which is the absolute, how it needs to be. I, I need to write for, you know, the characterization needs to come through every interval um, to, to make this work be as vivid as it can be. Wes, would you like to comment? My third novel was about classical music um, at the uh, just for the second, just for the First World War, and um, it was called Charles Jessel Considered as a Murderer, in which the focal modernist opera is is a version of the folk song Little Musgrave, and it's all about murder and adultery, and you know. And during that, I did a lot of research about composers. And is there a composer called Jonathan Harvey? John Harvey? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. He wrote a wonderful book, quite small, about, you know, composers in their own words kind of book. And there's a whole thing on who is a composer writing for. There's a whole chapter. And of course, the range is massive. You know, some are writing for the ideal audience and some are writing for the... Um, you know, themselves only, and others are writing for, you know, so that, and it was a wonderful chapter for me to read. I will leave the discussion of who Erilyn is writing for entirely to Erilyn. Who I was writing for was I am writing for the whole history of the Dido myth I want to add to. I wanted to have my foot in the river of that tradition and dabble my toe in and let that whole river of tradition flow by me and just make my little, my one statement about it. And that is that nobody has ever put the two parts of Dido and Aeneas and what we are calling Dido's ghost, the return of Anna to Aeneas has ever done that before. And that's who I wrote the story for and who I write the lines for is as a singer, I know what I would like to sing. And I hoped that that would mean that what I gave Erilyn, she would immediately see as a singable thing. So I just wrote them for me. To, I, I, does it sing? If it sings, if she thinks it sings, then that's... I mean, I love this account because on the one hand, it's very straightforward and personal. But on the other hand, it's saying the forms of agency in making an opera including the fact that Erilyn now has Golda's voice, as it were, inside her, is very complex. And I think it would be really exciting if we can com communicate to wider audiences some of the rich, the human richness of making an opera. And is this a good segue, Freddie, perhaps, to talk about something which is really a signature of mahogany, which is workshopping not just the practical stuff, but the whole model of how people work together, which is encompassed in that notion of workshop. So, Freddie. Well, absolutely. And I think it's also about thinking about the timeline of creating a, a production and when these moments of collaboration happen. And what, what we're really keen to do with, in, with Mahogany is, is about getting, for example, the singers into a room with the composer while the composer is still writing. And what was so exciting about the workshop a couple of weeks ago was that we were really able to, to hear the, um, Wes's words and Erilyn's music embodied in a singer's mouth and in their, in their body um, when the music wasn't even finished yet by any means. You know, it was only a few fragments. And I think by, by having that kind of input so early on, that does a lot of what you're talking about, Lynn Miller, in terms of this magical fusion of, of different, uh, different people and different influences and, and, and the sense that everyone is invested and, and has agency in, in, in creating this piece. Freddie, I think it'd be very helpful if you said what you actually did in the workshop 
that you've just had, and I believe that Ed, one of the singers, is with us. Yeah, Ed is here. I don't know if Grace is Grace was going to join us, but maybe it's not quite time yet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we had a couple of days in a room in London. It rained a lot. We had to keep all the windows open because of COVID, and we all had to wear masks, and, and we weren't allowed to peer over each other's scores um, too closely. But nonetheless, it was still just wonderful and glorious to just be in a room with some musicians and with Erilyn. Um, John Butt was there um, on, on the piano. Um, I don't think he very often plays the piano. He's normally on the harpsichord. So that was, it was a nice rarity. Um, and we looked at three or four different sections of the piece. Um, with the focus on the dramaturgy, particularly though we, we, we picked moments that, for example, when, when Anna becomes Dido's ghost, which was quite an important moment in the piece. And we looked at a bit early on when Lavinia is meeting Anna for the first time, where a lot of the story is set up. So we needed to have a look at that just to see how it all, all worked. Um, we, we didn't just have singers, we had a couple of musicians as well. Um, I'm going to forget their surnames, Tim and Rosie. Tim Williams and Rosie Bogomzi, is that right? Tim yeah. Harris, Tim Harris. Oh, sorry, not Tim. Tim Harris, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, Tim plays the electric bass um, and Rosie is a percussionist with a particular um, speciality on something called a hand pan, which looks like a kind of, um, it's like a steel, like an inverted steel drum and it looks like a tortoise shell and it sits on your lap and, and you play, and when, when you play in different places, it, it makes different, um, different notes. Um, so we were looking at a particular sound world and those, were, those are the two instruments that are not part of the Dunedin consort makeup. So they're the kind of the two non-Baroque uh, instruments as it were, um, which is- another... Erilyn, could you say what your role in this workshop was? Yes. I. Um... I really wanted to, uh, uh, Tim Harris will be playing electric bass um, and there will be percussion. Um, and so those players I've worked with for years and years and I really thought long and hard, I felt we needed two other instruments that would add to this world of, um, of st mostly strings, strings, rock strings, so it'll be period instruments but I wanted to see what the blend might be with um, with electric bass and hand pan. And we all got very excited, didn't we, Freddie, when we we were trying some things out. Um, and John, we, we could just see that there are moments where new work, we could have a, a fantastic blending, but also times where we could really cut across. So in other words, the sound world is as important in many ways as the actual music in certain in the software. But one thing, Erilyn, that I found really interesting was that it wasn't just about how, how do we take the Purcell and, and work on it and blend the, the wallet into that, but it seemed to me that you were also thinking about how to, in, how to inform your own writing with a sort of Purcellian style, as it were, and, and, and really pairing away things from the, from the original music that you're going to write as well. Yes, it's important that I um, I'm infused with the person because it's I don't it's not doing something to the person it's it's making the, everything feel inevitable. How do I do that? Wes, were you part of the workshop at the weekend? No, they forgot to phone me up. <laughs> no, I, I was I was here's the truth of it. I was uh, ready to come in at whenever it was, you know, 3 p.m. on Saturday, Sunday, as arranged. But sadly, the room was so cold that they had to stop the rehearsal only. So I only had a, a well, we had quite a lengthy FaceTime uh, chat resume at the end of the rehearsals. So, but my vision is that I'm at all of these things, literally with a pencil and a piece of paper. And, and they say to me, oh, we need you to look at this line now. And I immediately write a new version on the spot and give it back to them and they go, that's it, where's great? And Can I just say that we seem to have had a power cut in um, oh. Edinburgh, maybe it's coming back, but I mean, I can still hear you and I hope you can still hear me. 
Wes, I asked you that question because it seems to me that your short story is full of the kinds of things that Freddie's concerned about when he says dramaturgy. So you may also have views about the production. Well, it's, it's very funny to hear you talking about the story because the story that Ludmilla has so kindly found is only exists because I wanted to write something with the 12 titles of the 12 songs on my album in order in it. And that was the story that came out. So it's strange to think of that story as a, even a thing. But um, once we had come across, you know, I had you know, I had these various ideas and with the identities, then of course, Freddie said, well, it's going to be, oh, there you are. Freddie said, oh, well, you know, if Dido is Anna, we have to differentiate between in very strong ways in a stage flat because he is a theater director. I am only writing a libretto on a page and though I've been in a number of plays etc in my life yet you know this is Freddie's very good at this and so anything that I might have thought about dramaturgy I was quite happy to uh, listen to him talking about in greater detail than I was in my own particular I mean because as he said some of these that is thing he said a couple of times is these cuts are slightly too filmic for what we need on the stage you know that we will need a bigger announcement than this and of course here's a key thing the stories are quite different, but the co a chorus is a chorus. And it was always very, very important to Erilyn and I that the chorus were a fully integrated member of her opera as they are a fully vital uh, member of the Purcell opera as well. And so that was from the get go, we were like that the chorus must, it's the same chorus and they will be having the same effect and agency as they do in the personal so that was that if you think of it as two separate things the intersection of the venn diagram contains aeneas anna dido and a very big chorus freddie I'm, I'm conscious that we would like very soon to bring more people in but i wondered if there was anything more you'd like to say about about your whole um approach um, um, I don't could I just flag one tiny idea, which is that I think you're very dedicated to what in other worlds is called co-curation or co-production. Co and I think this is an idea that's going to gather momentum. So it's something that it's important that mahogany is part of the conversation on. But, I mean, on the subject of co-production, I mean, we, we've worked with the Barbican before, which is great. So it's wonderful that we're coming back to the Barbican. But to be working with Dunedin Consort is really exciting. Um, and the idea of a contemporary opera company working with a Baroque ensemble is, is particularly exciting, I think. And, um, and, you know, just conversations that Erilyn and John and I have had, even just about what pitch it should be and, and just that, that melding of Baroque strings and, and a Baroque ensemble's mentality while bringing in a, a, a living composer and a composer like Erilyn, who is so sensitive to that world, but also brings so many other wonderful sounds and ideas. Um, I think that's, that is really exciting. And that was a, a, a very exciting thing for me in the, in the workshops was working with John, but. We do have a question from John Waite. So John, if you would like to put your question. Can John hear me or can someone facilitate that? I had just read his question and I slightly, I thought I'd slightly answered it just with what I've just said. John might need to unmute. John might need to unmute. Right, I'm unmuted. I, I put the question, uh, which is what influence do the actual performers have on, on a, an opera like this? Um, and also the, the venues. I don't know if you're just going to be at the Barbican mm. or are you going anywhere else? And, as a composer, you see sort of the end product in front of different people. And also, I think we have heard quite a bit about, I'm sorry, I, I asked the question, you may have answered, about the Dunedin Consort. It seems an exciting idea to have musicians like that doing an opera like this. I leave it to you. 
jo John, you know, that's a great question. And I think uh, to, have, to have an early music group and a group of such, um, you know, renown as Dunedin with John's absolute expertise, but to be in the, for him to have been in the workshop right at the beginning is just fantastic. So casually he'd say something and, you know, he, he's, he's a foremost Baroque scholar, you know, living Baroque scholar. And so the tiny things he says that are to do with um, technique are really sticking in my mind because I really have to conceive it's, for example, it's no point writing uh, these long phrases hoping to expect a particular sort of 19th century vibrato, that's not going to happen. So I have to find a way of, it, it actually has to inform the very material right at the beginning of how, how I make the strings work and uh, e even the, key, the keys I choose, you know, writing towards the open strings. Um, yeah, thinking about how the bow crosses for certain. So, so, yeah, there's a lot of technical details. And in fact, what we'll be doing in early February, uh, John and I, and, and I think Freddie will be working. We also want to try things out with the Theorbo player because Theorbo will be part of it. There's a lot of technical detail for me to really um, master to bring the old and new worlds together. And I think it'd be very different after it. If I was just writing this, you know, Dido's Goes, and writing for modern instruments, it, it, the music would be very, very different. To answer your question, John, about, about venues, um, so the, the, the production, as it were, in, at, at the Barbican is, and I'm not making excuses, but it is only, it is only going to be a, a sort of, um, I hate the word semi-staging, but it's going to be, a, you know, it's in Milton Court, it's not in a theatre, it's not going to be full bells and whistles, costume and set and what have you. Um, and we are talking to a, a number of other people who will be interested in taking that kind of concert version or, or semi-stage version. Um, nothing is confirmed yet, but possibly the Lamamua Festival. Um, and there are a couple of other people interested. Um, but there's definitely a, you know, I intend very much to um, sell this opera to opera houses all around the world and do a full, you know, give it the fully staged version as well at some point in the future. And, and, and in a sense, I can say that though the ambition might seem grandiose, my idea when I was thinking of this originally was Erolim was that it could become the way people might like to even stage the Purcell, that this might become you know, a modern way that makes the Purcell vital. You know, Purcell was, that was, Dido and Aeneas was one, you know, if not the very first opera, more or less, and then there wasn't really a great English opera for hundreds of years. It happens to be about, uh, you know, a queen who is something of a feminist icon, and as Erilyn Wallen herself, a beautiful person, of color and the, all these things just seemed so exciting to me uh, when we were writing it. And of course, back to what um, uh, John asked just now, uh, what you were talking about with the music, Erilyn, of course, in I love opera, but I didn't want to write, you know, I couldn't write an opera anyway, but I didn't want to write, you know, to be doing some kind of cod verdi or something that was all, all doing a production of something, nor would I want an opera that was, entirely chromatic and only that so to me with my love of the past but my love of the modern as well this seemed to combine everything I could ever envision being wonderful in an opera loving Erilyn's music as I do loving the Purcell as I do and then suddenly it occurred to me that when she was going I do you want to say anything about that how you how you're or maybe you have really but just the way that her music would and she would slightly rescore the Purcell to bring them together in certain ways, and how the Purcell would therefore be able to exert its extreme gravity and playfulness on Erilyn's music too. And that's exactly where I think of the things I like being at that exact epicenter as extremely traditional and utterly modern. I can say that better myself. <laughs> I think we're open for more questions and comments if ever anyone would just like to chip in.
it's always a quiet moment this moment yes and i think we have to penny penny please i feel there's a sort of a curious synergy between taking jerusalem and developing that and taking <laughs> and developing that and i wonder if those sort of tied in together in your mind or whether they're completely separate and unrelated but it, to me it seems a curious sort of coming together of different yes. things that's such a great question i would say you know I was, i've been working in lockdown i have you know working quite hard but i would say that commission which by the way i was only given three weeks to write it august the 11th i was asked and immediately i was thinking oh my gosh gold has got to learn this but suddenly it absolutely revitalized me um i don't know if other composers like this but the idea of having a conversation with other composers with music from the past is like a gift to me it's it's gift and it's utterly natural and and then to work with text and then to be able to work with an orchestra and, and the, a fabulous world so that that proms was was a great warming up for me for for dido's ghost dido's ghost and it was like fate saying hello i think golda would like to hear from ed and grace who were part of the um workshop how it was for them as singers if they're with us and can hear that invitation yeah i i'm here i don't know if grace is here but um it was um i mean i don't know if people um i only got hold of the music actually uh on the day at the start of the workshop which was um quite uh, potentially stressful for for a singer but it was um something that um, i i was very happy to do and very willing to do and by the end of 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 the kind of sunday session it, it felt incredibly ingrained as a um uh, as a role already although I was only doing it a small amount of it and what was really interesting was that um, because I didn't really know uh, I didn't know Wes at all I haven't met Wes hi Wes um, and uh, I only knew of uh, Erilyn her uh, through her uh, through her renown as a composer um, it's interesting that um, Wes says that um, he's written something that's the, the, the libretto is written to be singable and it totally is singable from a singer's point of view which is fantastic um and with erilyn's um, ability as a composer to set that text it makes a lot of sense musically so um from from my point of view it just became more and more enjoyable as the as the process went on working with freddie to to get an idea of of of, of this incredible story that's been created by wes and by erilyn um so it was just an incredibly organic process, but something that um, was just great to be part of. So I, I was very grateful to have that opportunity. Um, I'd you. like to bring Anne Miners in at this point because she has a number of, I think, very salient questions she'd like to ask about doing all this in the world of COVID. So Anne, would you like to come in here, please? Yes, I just wondered whether, um, just this spacing out of people is making your thoughts, uh, Erilyn, more more spatial in terms of how you think about the music and uh, where you place the musicians and in relation to the singers and, and also where you might place the audience. I know we're under some restrictions, but equally there might be opportunities. Oh gosh, I'm, I'm hoping that when Diabetes Ghost goes on, it's, it, um, it's back in the world as we know it. Um, mm. Being in rehearsals for the for Jerusalem was it was adds a whole layer of extra time needed. Uh, I would say um, I think I mean and Freddie can speak about this. Things will space you know the, the setting and how people are grouped around the stage is very important and people won't necessarily be all together. But I do need we do need proximity for the best. Um, what's the word ensemble? Yeah. Yeah, well, agreed. Um, well, certainly, certainly with uh, Freddie in Berlin, uh, Erilyn in a lighthouse in Scotland, and me in Philadelphia, it was the most socially distanced opera ever written. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anne, would you like to pursue this line of thought a bit more? Um, well, just, just a little bit more, to know a little bit more about how you're thinking about the opera within the opera, how you might... Well, maybe it's not got that far, but is, is there something about closing down and being more intimate and more intense with that? It's about the opera within the opera certainly isn't a, I like your layers of an onion uh, analogy there. I mean, but to me, it's not, 
it's not like a little Fabergé egg is sitting in the middle of Erlen's opera. It mm. is a powerful work of art that exerts a profound psychological hold on its audience, as I would argue Dido and Aeneas by Purcell does anyway and has to me. And um, But who it's exerting it on is some of the protagonists of that who are drawn into the opera, who melt into the opera, whose psyches it takes over and causes profound mental states in them uh, which lead them both to murderous thoughts and also you know so it's it, it to me it's it's in there but it's not sitting in there like a you know the it's 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 exerting its power and a fully integrated and that is I will say again that is because you know we were going in that direction a little bit and Freddie really helped it along in that direction so that you know he can t take an immense amount of credit for that well although i think it was your idea wes just to throw back of course a it was my idea <laughs> um, <laughs> it was your idea to the chorus so the chorus in the wallen are the audience for the purcell so yes they're then so it, it's not just that the individuals are pulled up on stage to become Dido, become Aeneas. And basically everyone sort of gets gets wrapped up into the Purcell. Um, yes. And so these, so so we will, we, we I imagine we'll define the stage within the stage, but those lines will then become very blurred as the whole drama um, in, in, unfolds. And. And I hope, as ever, of course, that the real audience will also then be, be drawn through these different layers and, and feel more and more uh, involved. And I mean, just to answer your practical question, I'm, um, I'm trying as much as possible to think about, or I'm trying as much as possible not to think about COVID, but I am thinking about COVID with regard to the production. And we're talking with the Barbican and there are sort of various um, plan Bs and plan Cs in terms of options, in terms of going into different spaces. and actually an advantage of this production being a bit semi-staged or, or sort of you know, a staged concert means that there is much more flexibility actually in terms of how we can adapt to different spaces. Yeah. You're not gonna have a sodding great bit of set that won't fit into one room but would only fit into another room, for example. Mm -hmm. Would it be worth us having a little think about how we might convey some of what we've been talking about this evening to audiences through programs or through online uh, materials that we might put make available to people? Mm -hmm. Because I, I certainly feel very strongly that programs are highly conventionalized. Mm -hmm. um, and when I've tried, I, I'm a supporter of the Edinburgh International Festival, when I've tried to I don't know whether I'm supposed to say this, but anyway, when I've tried to say, could we imagine programs happening differently? I'm not sure that people are very keen to see a different model of the program, but it could be the most important bridge between audiences and everyone else. And th if that is the case, then surely we must be thinking digitally as well. And that's one thing that COVID has, has taught us about the power of of the of complex digital me media, you know, not just Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if anyone would like to respond to that. I'm afraid I didn't catch a lot of that. The my, my video the video signal went weird. Ah, uh, I'm inviting you to think about how we can convey to audiences something of the complexities we've been talking about tonight and that that might disrupt some conventions in the music world and in the opera world, not least that the opera world is very fixated on individual stars, whilst I think one of the things we're learning is how collaborative, how, how much it is about co-curation for all the musicians involved, for many other people as well. So I guess I'm trying to push you a little bit to to see whether we could think differently. What would a program look like in this new world? Mm. What would a website look like in this new world? Anybody? 
think some orchestras are doing kind of interesting things about sort of living programs. I think that's, I mean, I, I don't, I think it, um, Aurora doing kind of do quite interesting things. It might not be everyone's cup of tea, but they're definitely kind of experimenting with the idea of a kind of living program or a kind of program note, what they do around their Beethoven's, their um, memorized Beethoven concerts are quite interesting. They did one at the proms. Um, it was, I think it was quite difficult for Nick to do it in that context of having zero audience in the hall. So it felt like he was doing <laughs> this kind of demonstration of the programme to this ginormous empty cavernous space. Um, but I think that thing of definitely with orchestral music of kind of bringing out themes and things that we can listen to and sort of um, unraveling this complex thing that might be in a program sonata form which to be honest to most people do they need to know what sonata form is to enjoy something most probably not but I'm picking that to actually give musical examples I think does work really well and multi-story orchestra also are another ensemble that do quite interesting things around um, that kind of introducing themes of music. But I wonder how you might do that in, in an operatic context. Because also there's the thing of not wanting to give the game away when it's a new piece, which is something we struggle with. When it's yeah. Eroica, people have heard Eroica a million times, but they, there's something that can enlighten them or they can find out something more. But it's quite likely if you're watching at the proms that you might have heard it before. So things aren't going to be a surprise, even as beautiful as it is. But with a new piece of opera, how much, how can you kind of bring people in without not them missing the chance to find out about it while they're watching it? Ali, I think it would be helpful if you said who you were because I don't know if everybody's got you on their on their screen. Oh, while you're yeah. Talking. Given that you are so central to mahogany, I, I think it would be Absolutely. lovely if you just said a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so I'm Ali. I work for Mahogany with Freddie and Mark and Caroline and Ludmilla and Penny, obviously, on our board. Yeah, so that's me. So I think, I think Ludmilla, the question around how we bring the audience in and how the audience feel part of something before they arrive because again it breaks down this elitism and this hierarchical thing of entering into a space or coming to see an opera for the first time or not even coming to see an opera for the first time it might be your 50th time seeing an opera but how you how we become more together but uh, yeah and I think the program is 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 interesting um I'd like to interject a little on this point oh, as yeah. well if I may yeah. <laughs> um I, I think it's some of the things that, that you may be thinking about, Ludmilla, I think things like this are a great example and a great way to sort of move forward with that, you know, having this available for people to, to view before they go and see, to get that understanding of the process and how those ideas have come to together is a great thing. And I think it's something that, as an organisation, Mahogany Opera is constantly learning about, but actually does quite well and thinking about all of the things we've put together for the various stages workshops that people would come and see and talk about what then couldn't, but we then produced all of these fabulous blogs and videos, which gave people a glimpse into how all of these things come together and what these projects meant. And I think things like that are a great way as an alternative to a traditional programme where they can find out about those things either before they go and see to get some understanding before they see it, or if those people that enjoy that magic of going to see something without that understanding can then look afterwards and say, oh, actually, yes, that's how these things came about. That's how it all tied together. And I think, as you say, sort of looking at those different ways to engage people in that process is, is a really interesting thing to do. Mark, right. could you just say who you are? Because obviously some of us know you very well as the key figure around Snappies, for example. Indeed, yes. So um, for those that don't know me, I am Mark. Um, I am a producer with Mahogany Opera. Um, and I, as Liv Miller just mentioned, I primarily look after our children and young people work our Snappy Office programme. And I was, I, was, I was only going to say that I very much like what Ali said about, uh, for example, I've always felt with, a, with a, an older piece that people know very well, 
you know, I think it's fair to have a, for example, a synopsis in there. I would be very keen for there not to be a synopsis of this libretto in a performance of an early production on it, because I want people to be hanging on everything. I want them not to know who's going to die and who's going to sing uh, Die Dose Aria. And I don't want people to know those things. And I want them to be shocked, not in a in a cheap way, but in a profound way, where when they hit it for the first time, they go, my God, that's what art can do. You know, that's, that's blown my mind. And I know John Butt would want that too, because he's a big fan of Hitchcock. <laughs> he's actually writing a book on Hitchcock at the moment. I'm very, I'm very excited. <laughs> I've just noticed that Grace has, has joined us. I just want to say hi to Grace. Um, Grace. I just wondered whether Grace, you you wanted to add anything. We we were just talking about the workshops and how wonderful Erolyn's music is to sing, and whether you have any thoughts about the music that we asked you to sing at the workshops. Yeah, like Ed, I, I was drafted in not as last minute as Ed, but I was drafted in at the last last minute. And um, I really enjoyed singing it. More, it, it it was in the room. It was really lovely to sing. You know, I guess. Most sopranos like to sing high, but sometimes when you're presented with a high C, it's always done in a horrible way. But I think Erilyn did it in a great way. It was it was fun. It was it was really fun to sing, and especially the bit at the end. Oh, it was heartbreaking. It was so sad and beautiful. Yeah. How she weaved in bits of the Purcell in 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 that in that in, in Ed's line while I was singing something completely different. Oh, it. The bits I've heard, I really enjoy. And I think any soprano singing Anna slash Dydens, it was Anna slash Dydens, um, yes. is really enjoy singing it. For me, it was, it was really fun. Once I got it right, it was, it was really fun. And Grace, you know what was so lovely about working with you? You know, uh, we were able to try things. So you'd say things, let's try that down the octave, try that rhythm moved along there. All of that was just, I can't tell you, so invaluable for me um, to get the actual pacing right and, and get the octaves right. So, so thank you so much. Welcome. I'm glad I could help. Yeah. I wish, I'd, I wish I'd heard it, but I mean, it must be said that the part of Anna, Dido, and Dido's ghost, it's a big part. It really, it, it, there's a lot of it to go about, isn't there, Erilyn Wallen? Definitely. And... The other thing, yeah, died it, and then to actually, you know, and the person they don't really sing that much together, not not so much. So to give them a, a proper confrontation is also exciting. Golda, I hope you're um, pleased <laughs> by what you're hearing. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little bit afraid, but <laughs> mostly pleased. <laughs> and thank you, Grace, for making sure that it's that that I can still sing it. I'll be I'll be pleased. You can definitely you can <laughs> definitely sing it. I'm not sure about me, but you can definitely sing. Don't worry. Now yeah. I hope you'll be in the room when we when we actually start rehearsing it. I'm going to need some notes for sure. <laughs> not from me. Not from me. Oh my god. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Even, I'd be like this. Do it again. <laughs> I wouldn't be any use. I'm really sorry. Um, I can't wait to hear it though. A really come on in its entirety because it was I didn't I didn't know how it would work going from Erilyn's music to Purcell back to Erilyn and it does it works in a way I never thought it could and that was nice it was a nice surprise it's great it's really good I think we don't have that much longer left so it's partly a question of speak now or, or forever hold your peace but it might also be a question of would anyone like to throw out ideas for future conversations? I think the whole ma mahogany team is here. Is we're all very keen to hear what you think. Uh, um, I mean, I think it's been fascinating. I feel we could have gone on for much longer. So, but any thoughts? Yes. Uh, hello, this is Bob, the other half of Anne. <laughs> Bob Essert with sound space uh, acoustics and and venue design. Uh, two thoughts to answer your previous question about um, how to how to develop interest in this with for the audiences before, during, or or after. Two two different thoughts. One is 
finding the support for uh, a making of video. There's plenty of experience around for, you know, you've got a great idea. If you've got a great idea and you, and you can sell it a little bit to, to get some funding for following through some of the workshops and making a record of that, that can, can be really wonderful. I've, I've enjoyed lots of those that have been made in the past. And the other is, is a word right now that, that comes to mind when you're talking about this piece um, that might fit for some people, and that's augmented reality, the, di the digital aspect of digital world of people where, where you're looking in one, into one world through another world and with the lens of another world. And that may have something that could be developed into either PR or maybe in the production itself, but not, not to take it too literally, but if you just take it at its fundamental, it may have something to help gel your fundamental uh, ideas into something that can resonate with some young folks who, who might, hey, that's cool stuff. Um, I want to go to that. And in that sense, forging collaborations between opera and the worlds of science and technology does seem to me to be a very high priority for us. Mm -hmm. Not where the technology is, as it were, behind the scenes and therefore not remarked, but where technology is at the forefront of the conversations and so that people can come to understand the roles that technology has the potential to play, which will also enable us to be much more creatively critical of scientific and technological development. There may be some interesting purely musical aspect of that too that I, I haven't thought about until I'm just <laughs> spouting on it now. It's, it's thought of more of the, in, the, in the architecture and design world as a gra graphical thing to start with, but actually it can have a whole oral um, aspect as well of overlaying uh, and, and seeing something through another lens, which is just, I'm just restating the words you're, you're all using tonight. <laughs> What you've said is so fascinating to me. And you know what's interesting? Already, the bass, um, Tim Harris, the bass guitarist, he's actually, I know him, he's, he'll be studying the Purcell intensely. And he'll actually, this idea of layering augmented reality is so perfectly put, which is what we are sort of trying to achieve. I think I'd like to just ask, thank you, Erilyn, um, Wes and Freddie, are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? I'll just say I'll just say one thing. In a, in a sense, it, it isn't. It, it's only pertinent in the genesis of this. But over the last two three years, I've been writing a book. Well, I wrote uh, the, a book with Mark Morris, the choreographer, mm -hmm. and his memoir called Out Loud. We're very good friends, and we wrote it together because he likes my writing and he wouldn't have done it on his own. And of course, his version of Dido and Aeneas, uh, which is a version with the singers in the pit, with the orchestra and only dancing on stage. Mm -hmm. I've seen that maybe uh, five or 10 times now. And when Erilyn said last October, you know what? I think someone's interested. I think this is, I think this is a goer, you know, I think we can do this now. I was, I came to this project in such deep knowledge of the Purcell and of the text. And, and then of course, the funny thing was, it turned out that Erilyn and I were using completely different editions of the Purcell, which, which was very funny in itself and a thing we had to sort out. But just, if anybody wants a treat, and they haven't seen it, that Mark Morris version of Dido and Aeneas is out on a DVD that can be gotten, probably seen on, you know, Amazon or somewhere. And it's just, it's a glorious thing. And no singers on the stage, just you're looking at Stephanie Blythe in the pit. Yeah. Just Freddie. The, just, well, the, only thing I, the, the only thing I want to say is that, Wes, you've dropped so many interesting books and references, and I've seen some people sort of desperately trying to scribble it down, but um, what we might do is just gather all of those and yeah. send them around to people because... Uh, yeah, I, will, I, think, I think a really, I, I always think that a fun thing to do is have a reading list, like in the back of a book where you acknowledge Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a pile of books on my table that is the key to everything I've written. I mean, it's there in 25 books, everything. 
Can we limit it to Dido's ghost just for now? And <laughs> <laughs> That's a you mean change my books for Dido's. Oh, yeah. That does bring me to how I'd like to wrap things up, which is to say thank you to everybody. But please stay with us on this conversation and send us your ideas because I think Mahogany is very interested in developing, for example, research projects around some of these issues. We believe this is a very, very important area and that we can make a contribution to it. And I think the idea that this is the first in a series of conversations. Conversations never end in a sense, as we know, we're still in conversation with Virgil and so on. So if we in Mahogany can be the progenitors of some of these long conversations, I, I think we'd be thrilled to bits. And thank you so much. And of course, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and to have had Golda Schultz with us as well, obviously has been really lovely and, um, Thank you for joining us, everyone. And uh, perhaps we can raise a, a metaphorical grass, glass to the next time. And can I just say nothing to do with power cuts. It was I abandoned my computer and it went to sleep. So everything went into darkness. So I, sincere apologies. I was so caught up with what was going on that I didn't remember to, you know, press it and keep it awake. Um, I hope that won't happen again. But on behalf of everyone at Mahogany, um, thank you. <laughs>